Hello, my name is Marty Johnson. I'm founder of Total Health Nutrition Center, and I want to welcome you to our immune seminar series. I'm excited to really go into different things, or all the practitioners are going to be going into different things that will really touch on stuff that maybe you, your doctor will never tell you about, okay? So we're going to go into the different sciences as to why you could be not feeling well even though your blood work looks normal and various things of that on that order. Because of how all your organs work together as a whole, the things that we're going to be teaching and talking about are really going to get into areas besides just immune system. So things like why you might have fatigue and brain fog or why you might have hormone imbalances that lead anything from the thyroid issues to menopausal symptoms and even weight loss resistance okay so for instance sally she's a client of mine that uh, came to me with graves disease and uh, we worked with her to graves disease is actually an overactive thyroid condition and detoxification and various things that can help with immune function were involved in her protocol and because of that her autoimmune thyroid condition actually was resolved where she is no longer on medications which is a great thing but she also tells us that her immune function is much better she doesn't get sick as often and her sleep patterns actually improved a lot so when we work on one area, there's always other benefits, which is a great thing, and that's going to apply to this whole series. Really, I've done enough of these talks over the years, and so have the other practitioners, to know that a lot of you are not listening to this webinar strictly to learn just about more information on weight loss or more information on the immune system but there might be something that's actually affecting the quality of your life because of the way your health is and you're looking for answers, you're searching for answers and that's what we hope to deliver to you today. So I want to challenge you to do something right now. I want you to get a pen and paper out if you don't already have it and I want you to write this down, okay? If your health was exactly where you wanted it to be, what would that look like to you? Okay, I'll give you a few examples. So say if my health was exactly where I wanted it to be, I would have the energy to get done with my workday and still have energy to go and do maybe the to-do list things that I keep putting off or to go and do those hobbies that I haven't gotten to because I'm too tired at the end of the day. Or maybe if my, um, let's say, my mental clarity was exactly where I wanted it to be, um, I would have more confidence in not forgetting things when I'm you know, going from room to room or being able to better multitask and have more confidence in doing that. Or maybe if your weight was exactly where you wanted it to be, um, you would have more self-confidence to go on the trip that, uh, and wear the clothing that you really would like to wear that you've been putting off. Or maybe it's that if you didn't have the joint achiness that um, you, you had that you would uh, be able to maybe do the more you know bucket list things that you've been kind of thinking that you're never going to get to because you're feeling too achy. So those are some examples. I'd like you to write these things down and throughout even this seminar series as you think of things keep making that list okay because it's so important that you get clear on what you really really want with your health so that you actually can get where you want it to go. So um, a couple of promises that I'm going to make from this seminar to you is that we're going to show you, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to show you the science as to maybe why the doctor is telling you that everything's fine but yet you don't feel fine. We're going to get into why that might be or why your immune system may be compromised or how your immune system can be compromised even though you, you're not even aware of it. Okay, So there's things that can be going on that you're not even aware of. You don't want to be caught off guard when something comes along. And also how we can help, um, basically help you to resolve some of these issues and the course of action that we take to do that and how we do that. Uh, we're gonna show you that because I think we owe that to you as well as to show you, hey, this is how you can actually get it done. All right, so I wanna welcome you again to the seminar and enjoy.
Hi, my name is Paige Welsh, and I am one of the practitioners here at Total Health. And today I want to talk about everything you need to know about immunity and give you some tips and ideas on how to regenerate and rejuvenate your immune system. But before I begin, a little bit about myself. So I have a master's degree in clinical nutrition and an undergraduate degree in health education and nutrition as well. And um, my personal areas of expertise reside in things like autoimmunity, hormonal health, detoxification, digestion, um, and fatigue as well. And I have been at Total Health for about six years now. So I um, would love to get to know any and all of you listening in, but let's get started with immune health. So what is the immune system? The immune system is actually derived from your bone marrow, and it's a collection of white blood cells that are scattered throughout your body. So when the white blood cells come out of the bone marrow, they are converted into a specific member for your immune system. So for example, if you have a viral infection, then that white blood cell will turn into a specific form to help you fight off that virus. Whereas if you have an environmental allergy or a food allergy, then the white blood cell will turn into a completely different form than that viral form and will help you fight against that allergen. So your immune cells will address issues both inside the cell and help fight infections outside of the cells as well. And problems really start to begin with your health and your immune system when various stressors interfere with those immune cells, um, which will reduce your ability for the immune system to respond to an invader. So what all affects your immune system? Everything from what you think, to how stressed you are, to what you eat, to how well you sleep, and how toxic your environment is, are all going to affect your immune cells and their ability to fight off infection. So if you are super stressed, if you are eating too much sugar or consuming too much caffeine, or if you're exposed to a toxic environment, um, then your immune system is going to suffer. The more stressors that you're personally dealing with, the harder it is for your immune system to protect you. So other stressors that may interfere with your immune system include things like lyphosate and GMO foods. The three most common GMO foods in our country are soy, wheat, and corn. Pesticides and fungicides, which are sprayed on a lot of our crops and our foods. Um, heavy metals, such as mercury, lead, and aluminum. Chemicals such as chlorine and BPA, which is found in plastics and other chemicals found in plastics. Uh, poor digestive health and hormonal imbalance are all going to affect your immunity. So what role does the immune system really have? A lot of people think that the immune system is really just for protecting us against things like the cold and the flu. However, the immune system is also going to help you fight off and control the balance of things like yeast, um, bacteria, viruses, and parasites, which are all pathogens that will affect your immune system and live in the body. So in a normal healthy immune system, there's going to be a, a colony of these different pathogens and they're going to be in the right balance. But when they get off kiltered, then that's going to um, really start to affect your health and it can start to affect things like your energy, your weight, your mood, anxiety, depression, hormonal um, imbalance. It can um, affect and lead to things like autoimmunity and even cancer. So your immune system plays a a big role in more than just fighting off infection. It can also affect your energy, your weight, your hormones, and your mood as well. A common thing that um, people realize when they get older is that their immune system starts to decline and get gets lowered. And this is true, um, however, it's not inevitable. And um, one other cause of this is as we get older, usually, our inflammation gets higher. So 
as we age, our immune system becomes more alarmed and more alert from all those stressors that I just talked about. And all of this is going to affect your inflammation levels. So other things that will affect your inflammation include things like uh, your diet, your st stress load, and your environmental toxins. So unfortunately, um, a lot of people do get more inflammation as they get older. However, this is not inevitable. And it's really interesting. So I see clients um, from birth all the way to about 80. I think my oldest is 80 right now. And um, some of the younger clients actually have more inflammation than some of the older clients. And then obviously some of the older clients are going to have more inflammation than some of the younger ones. So depending on how um, your lifestyle is, you can keep that inflammation low or promote it to be high. And this all in turn is going to affect your immune system. So when the inflammation is lower, then your immune system cells um, are less likely to get injured and are going to be stronger at protecting you. So knowing where your inflammation levels are at, especially on a cellular, cellular level, is a key factor to optimal immunity. One of the tests that we actually can do in the clinic is um, called a meta-oxy urine test, and this will measure your levels of cellular inflammation, which in our opinion is a lot more valuable than a blood test for inflammation because it shows us those levels um, without you maybe even realizing that you're inflamed. Sometimes too, by the time that your blood levels reflect that there's high inflammation, you've been inflamed for a very long time. So the urine in urine tests can pick up on inflammation a lot sooner, and especially in people who don't have pain or don't think that they're inflamed at all. All right, so how can we regenerate our immune cells and keep your, the immune system healthy? So the key word here is to regenerate. You want to rejuvenate and regenerate your immune system um, and your immune cells rather than over activating the immune system. So un unfortunately, some people can actually over activate the immune system. And this can lead to something called a cytokine storm. A cytokine storm can then lead to irreversible damage, and even death, um, possibly. So make sure that you're talking to a trusted healthcare provider before that, before you decide to implement any um, supplements or protocols for your immune system. So in the clinic, we take an individual basis for each case. We really take into account a person's health history, their goals, what their current state of health is in before we recommend any um, protocol. So the people that need to be most concerned about this are those with autoimmune disease and cancer. So the first step in rejuvenating your immune cells is to improve your gut health. So I know Mona's doing a, a video on um, digestive health and immunity for this summit. So make sure to tune into hers, but um, just a little bit about gut health. About 50% of your immune, system, your immune cells go straight to the gut and they sit in something called the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, which is also known as the GALT. And the GALT helps protect your body um, from invasion that's happening inside the gut. So you could have, be fighting off a bacteria in the gut, and if your GALT is strong, that bacteria will never get out into the bloodstream and affect other areas of the body. However, if there's any inflammation in there, then you're more likely to get a bacteria or a virus or anything, really a toxin, to get into the bloodstream and affect any organ. Um, so depending on what you feed your gut, your immune system is going to respond to that. If you feed your gut a lot of junk food, processed foods, um, packaged fast foods, hydrogenated oils, vegetable oils, um, GMO foods, and sugars, your immune system is going to be on high alert and it's gonna make it much harder for your body to fight off an actual infection. The next uh, tip I would give would be to prioritize your sleep. This will allow you to produce enough T cells, which is really important in particular for fighting off viral infections, but sleep is also needed for growth and repair. So you may wanna consider sleeping in a pitch black room, even a, the little bit 
little bit of light is going to keep your um, body awake. So we have photoreceptors on all of our skin, which will be affected by any sort of light in the room. And that will help, pre that prevents you from getting into a good deep quality sleep. So you may wanna consider something like an eye mask to put over your eyes or blackout curtains to keep the room nice and black. You also want to pay attention to the temperature that your room is. The optimal sleeping temperature is between 60 and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Anything below that or above that is going to make it harder for you to fall, may make it harder for you to fall asleep, stay asleep, or get into deep sleep. You may also want to consider avoiding um, blue light and artificial light, especially after sunset. I recommend to my clients to turn off all devices at least an hour before bed, but if that's too difficult, then you may want to consider wearing blue light blocking glasses at nighttime or once the sun sets. Uh, you also want to um, consider maybe wearing socks to bed. That's another one of my tips because that will signal to the brain that um, it's bedtime. So it may help you fall asleep a little easier. So I see a lot of clients that do struggle with falling asleep and or staying asleep. And there's many different root cause issues to why that could be going on. So if this is a concern of yours, please consider calling um, the clinic and speaking to one of the practitioners about your issues and we could help you identify those root cause issues. We also have various um, YouTube videos that we've recorded and articles we've written on our website. So be sure to check those out. It might give you a little more information as well. Next, um, I would like to go over how to optimize your diet to rejuvenate your immune cells. So you want to make sure that you're eating plenty of fruits, vegetables, and if you're not a vegetarian or vegan, um, high quality grass fed pastured animal products and wild caught seafood and fish every single day. So you want to also make sure that you're getting a diversity of these foods in your diet because when you um, eat the same foods over and over again, you're more likely to develop a food sensitivity and that's going to make it a lot harder to fight off infections. Um, so if you eat the same foods over and over again, it's also going to um, keep your, your immune cells um, not strong enough to um, fight off what they need to be fighting off. And it, that will place further stress on the immune system. So diversity is key. A couple tips I have for this would be to try to eat all the colors of the rainbow. So you may wanna consider doing um, like a really good salad that's got chopped up red peppers for your red. You could throw in a hard boiled egg. That would be your orange and your yellow. Um, you could do a variety of leafy greens for the green, blue, blueberries, chop up some red onion for the purple, and then do um, a homemade olive oil balsamic vinegar with Italian seasoning or Mediterranean seasoning on top. So that would be the entire color of the rainbow. Um, I also play a little game when I grocery shop where I try to find the fruits and vegetables that are on sale that week and I try to make sure they're different from what I've eaten the week before or the week before that. And then what I do is I go home and I try to find a recipe that they're used in. And if all else fails, then I'll usually just um, chop them up and I'll throw it on a baking sheet, drizzle some avocado oil and season it really well and then bake until they're soft. So that's a way to get diversity into your diet. Uh, the foods that you want to avoid the most to protect your immune system are um, sugars, processed carbohydrates, like breads, crackers, and pastas, hydrogenated and vegetable oils, such as corn, canola, and soybean oil, conventional dairy products. Um, a lot of my clients have food sensitivities to dairy and they don't even realize it. So if you are going to be eating dairy, make sure that you're eating grass-fed organic dairy. You're less likely to have an immune reaction to that versus conventional dairy products. And then grains, especially GMO grains like corn and wheat can be very inflammatory and can um, disrupt the immune system. 
Next, make sure that you're staying hydrated. So try to sip on clean filtered water at least every 15 to 20 minutes throughout the day. The key here is that it's clean and filtered. So unfortunately, tap water and even most bottled water contains chemicals and heavy metals, which are going to further disrupt your immune system. So um, it's important to stay hydrated, not only for energy and detoxification, obviously, but um, you want to make sure that you don't allow your mouth to get dry. When your mouth gets dry, it becomes very acidic, and this allows various um, viruses and bacteria to take over, and it's going to make it harder for your body to fight off infection. So um, make sure that you're prioritizing your oral care. Some other tips you may want to try would be coconut oil pulling. I try to oil pull multiple, multiple times during the week, and then I even throw in some Thieves Essential Oil when I oil pull to help remove any pathogenic or harmful bacteria or viruses in the mouth. And then you want to also consider um, avoiding fluoride in your toothpaste because that's going to disrupt the beneficial bacteria in your mouth. So the more beneficial bacteria you have in your mouth and in your gut, the stronger your immune system will be. Next, you want to make sure to keep your stress levels as low as possible. So due to the high demands of society, all this high stress lives we're living, I do recommend engaging in some sort of stress reducing activity every single day. So you could consider things like meditation, prayer, light yoga, journaling, reading, aromatherapy, taking a bath, and then breath work. So breath work is free. You can do it anywhere. Um, my personal favorite is something called four, seven, eight breathing. It's where you breathe in for a count of four. You then hold for a count of seven and you breathe out for a count of eight. So this is really relaxing to your nervous system. Um, it helps calm you down and this will really help your immune system as well. So if you're someone that does suffer with anxiety or um, depression, then you may want to consider watching the webinar I made on um, fatigue, anxiety, and insomnia. I recorded that online, and if you go to our website, to totalhealthinc.com, go under the YouTube tab, it'll be under there. Um, I go into more detail with that, and you may also want to just consider calling one of our practitioners to speak more about your case. Next, you want to um, get sweaty, so engage in regular exercise, which will improve um, immunity. And um, we get, we get, when we get sick, we get a fever for a reason. So it's good to get your body temperature up if you want to keep your immune system strong. So exercising, even sauna use. And if you have a sauna, if, you ha if it's big enough, you may even want to consider doing something like yoga or stretching in the sauna to get the benefits of both. Next, um, you want to consider getting your vitamin D levels checked, and this is because vitamin D is one of the most important nutrients for our immune system. Um, the medical range for your vitamin D blood levels is between usually about 25 to 100 nanograms per milliliter. However, we find that to have optimal immunity, you should really be between 60 to 80 nanograms per milliliter. So you may have a level of 30 and your doctor may say, oh, you're a little low, but it's fine. When in our opinion, it's way too low. Your immune system's going to suffer when your um, blood levels are that low. So try to get your levels checked if you can. Um, if not, it's a pretty safe bet that for those living in Wisconsin, they're going to need to supplement with vitamin D. Um, a safe dosage for that is usually between 5,000 to 10,000 I use per day. Just make sure that if you are supplementing with vitamin D, that it, you're also supplementing with vitamin K2. A lot of supplements will have the combination of the two. This is important for um, utilization and absorption of your vitamin D levels. There are tons and tons of other various um, nutrients to support your immune system. So some would include things like vitamin C, zinc, vitamin A, colloidal silver, oregano oil, um, and medicinal mushrooms all are really good. However, some of these nutrients are more supportive for prevention, while others are more supportive for if you are sick. 
So make sure that um, you're talking to a trusted healthcare provider so you kind of know what you're doing with that with supplementation. And if you have questions, if you want to learn the difference between the two, please give our clinic a call and you can talk to one of the practitioners or some, one of the store associates might be able to help you with that as well. Last, one of the easiest tips that um, might do the best for you would be just to consider a really good whole food based multivitamin. Um, so this will give you vi the vitamins and minerals that are essential for proper immunity. So a lot of my clients who um, start with a really good whole food based multivitamin report that they um, have stronger immune systems. So it's, it's a really good way to just get in a basis of good nutrition and to cover the basis for that. So I hope this was helpful for you. Um, if you do have any questions, personal questions, if you want to learn more about our clinic, we invite you to call us for a free 15-minute phone consult. The number to the clinic is 262-251-2929. You can also um, visit the website and fill out a contact um, request and submit that, and one of the practitioners will then call you. All right, so I hope you are staying well and healthy and have a great rest of your day. Hello everyone, my name is Christine Stein and I'm a holistic practitioner at Total Health. I specialize in using blue opal technology, neurofeedback, muscle testing, and nutrition. I use these tools to properly assess one's health situation. And I've been in the natural health field for close to 15 years. I'm really passionate about giving people hope that they can feel better and assisting them in getting their health back on track. One of the other tools that I love to incorporate in a healthy lifestyle is the usage of essential oils, which is what I'll discuss today. I have my level one certification through NAHA, which is the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy, and I'm working towards my Clinical Aromatherapy Practitioner Certification. So that's just a little bit about me, so uh, let's get started with the presentation. So the best way to prevent any illness is to keep your immune system strong and to avoid exposure. So in all cases of illness, general precautions are important. We know when a person has a healthy immune system, they are less likely to become sick. Of course, the hot topic right now is coronavirus, but like with any other respiratory illness, this virus is transmitted through respiratory droplets from an infected person that coughs or sneezes. These droplets can spread uh, to people who are nearby and possibly be inhaled. The good news is you can help prevent illness by building your immunity by taking preventative measures into your own hands. I love that quote um, by Benjamin Franklin that says, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's so true. And I'm going to give you some pointers uh, today on how to do that. But getting back to the essential oils, um, you have some really potent allies in this pandemic, and that's the essential oils. Essential oils are very effective against airborne diseases because of their volatile nature in addition to their antibacterial, antimicrobial, and antiviral qualities. Essential oils are distilled from plants into concentrated volatile substances that can purify the air. This quality makes them extremely effective for respiratory conditions by way of inhalation. It is this diffusive quality that allows essential oils to strengthen the immune system. So because the essential oils uh, molecularly are so small, um, they are easily inhaled into the respiratory system and can kill off anything that might be harboring in the mucous membranes as well as um, building your immune system with constituents that are good for you. And historically, aromatic herbs and spices have been proven useful in times of airborne illnesses precisely because of these properties, meaning the antimicrobial, antibacterial, and antiviral. Many discoveries revealing the benefits of using aromatic plants to prevent and treat respiratory conditions came from Europe in the 1900s. Now, rewinding back to the 19th century, it was observed that there was a low incidence of tuberculosis in the flower-growing districts of France. 
It was then realized that the workers who processed the flowers and herbs remained free of the respiratory illness that was common at the time. This led to some published studies showing that essential oils were able to kill the microorganisms of glandular and yellow fever, particularly the essential oils of oregano, cinnamon, angelica, and geranium. Plus, epidemics of the past were worsened by a lot of things. So uh, again, going back to the 19th century, there was rapid growth of urban areas with poor sanitation. Uh, there was horrific working conditions in factories. Uh, people were working dawn to dusk. They were working six days a week, not being able to get out in the sun, um, very stressed. Vitamin D3 was deficient. Uh, a lot of people were deficient and um, rickets was, was pretty common. And then we had the deterioration of the diet. So this is really um, the first time in history when sugar and white flour became staples um, in the diet. So do you see a pattern? I certainly do. I mean, today we continue to see many people deficient in, uh, in vitamin D3, especially in this latitude. Um, we, as Americans, consume way too much sugar, processed foods, and white flour. And these lifestyle choices do not support a healthy immune system. In fact, it actually weakens it. And scientific studies have found that a high amount of sugar profoundly suppresses the immune system. Here at Total Health, we specialize in educating and assisting people in adapting a positive, healthy lifestyle in order to support a strong immune system. Our wellness practitioners specialize in helping clients improve their health and get their lives back. So please stay tuned for a special opportunity that you won't want to miss that will be offered at the end of the presentation. Okay, so let me get back to immune health and essential oils. So I'm just going to mention a few things that you can do to help support your immune system um, and or keep it healthy if you're already doing so. The number one thing I would recommend is reducing your sugar intake. So 200 years ago, the average American ate only two pounds of sugar per year. In 1970, we ate approximately 123 pounds of sugar per year. Now today, that number has crept up to 152 pounds of sugar in a year, which if you break it down is equal to three pounds or approximately six cups of sugar consumed in one week. Again, scientific studies have shown over and over that high amounts of sugar profoundly suppresses the immune system. Now, another thing that Americans kind of lack in is vegetable intake. Only 14% of us get the vegetable intake that is suggested by the USDA. The rest of us get about a cup and a half of vegetables per day. Experts agree that we need a lot more to maintain good health. So, approximately five to six cups of vegetables per day, which kind of breaks down to two to three servings per meal. So that's a really good uh, number to kind of strive for to get the nutrients and minerals that your body needs to function correctly. Sleep. Now sleep is another issue. Um, most of us do not get quality sleep. Sleep deprivation causes elevated cortisol levels, which results in an impaired immune function. And of course, as you sleep, your body repairs and recovers. And if you're not sleeping, that isn't happening. And you repeat the cycle over and over. And after a while, it takes a toll on the body. So proper sleep hygiene is very much needed for a healthy immune system. Uh, reducing unnecessary stress. Now, that's easier said than done. Um, we all are exposed to stress. And a lot of times, you can't uh, avoid it. But there are some stress you can avoid, so trying to minimize that uh, would, would be great. Um, as again, it is uh, when we're more stressed, we release more cortisol, which does impair your immune system. Okay, so again, those are just some simple things that you could start on your own to enhance your immune system. But now I'm just gonna talk about some essential oils that are really great as antivirals and that uh, strengthen the immune system. So some of those include oregano, thyme, myrrh, lemon, cinnamon, uh, cinnamon meaning the genus should be the cassia, not the other cinnamon, 
uh, bergamot, zuja, copabia, eucalyptus, lemon balm, and frankincense. So not only are they antiviral, uh, but they also are effective against other pathogens like bacteria, fungus, and parasites. So there's uh, six uh, ways that I'm going to just talk about how uh, you can utilize these essential oils and how you can um, use them to uh, strengthen your immune system. So the first one is steam inhalation. So that's really great when you feel like you're getting sick, meaning maybe you're a little congested, um, your sinuses you know, may hurt. Um, the steam inhalation really works to clear out the sinuses plus kill off any pathogens that might be present in your nasal cavities. Um, but basically what you would do is fill a pot of water and bring to a boil. Once the water is boiling, you can remove it from the stove and add about two to four drops of any of the following essential oils. Eucalyptus, myrrh, clove, oregano, bergamot, frankincense, or lemon. After you add the essential oils, hold your head over the pot, and I would recommend staying at least a foot above it, um, obviously, so you don't burn your skin, and inhale for about five to 10 minutes. If you want more of a concentrated stream, you can drape a towel over your head, but again, um, stay at least a foot above the hot water. You can also do what's called a direct inhalation, um, which simply you just open up a bottle of essential oil and inhale, um, you know, just kind of waft the cap underneath the nose and inhale. And that's really easy because essential oil bottles are small enough where you can keep it in your pocket or in your purse. And you can do this several times a day um, to kind of uh, clear out the sinuses and help kill off any pathogens that might be in the nose already. Now for larger areas, room diffusers and atomizers are a really great option, and these are very practical. So these work by um, plugging them in. Uh, diffusers actually will, um, they will uh, sort of uh, diffuse cold water in the air with the essential oil. Atomizers kind of work like um, a nebulizer where um, it just reduces the uh, particle size so the molecules can be spread into the air more easily. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, there are great ways, again, to get essential oils into a larger space. I always tell people to be mindful of pets and children. Um, essential oils can be toxic to cats, especially of the citrus variety. And typically you don't want to run these diffusers or atomizers all day long, you know, you want to take a break. So I would recommend running it for 15 to 20 minutes, shutting it off, and maybe in a few hours going back to um, turning it on again for another 15 to 20 minutes. We can also apply essential oils topically. So applying the essential oils um, on the skin over the lymph nodes and adrenal glands after a shower is very helpful in um, supporting the immune system as well as trying to help the body remove anything that might be circulating in the system. So for this, I would dilute a total of three to, three to seven drops of um, one of these essential oils that I mentioned earlier um, in a carrier oil. So you could use almond, jojoba, or argan. You could even use an unscented lotion, a more of a natural lotion, meaning it doesn't have a lot of um, chemicals in it. It's, it's more natural. And you want to massage um, uh, main areas of, of lymph nodes, so like the sides of the neck, armpits, lower back, um, and then just above the kidneys where the adrenal glands are located. We can also make disinfectant room sprays, which are really effective in spraying on clothing and linens. So in this case, I would recommend people um, add 20 to 30 drops of essential oil to about four ounces of distilled water. Shake well before using. Um, add that combination into a spray bottle and you can deodorize and disinfect as needed. Now for hard surfaces like countertops, tables, that sort of thing, um, you can actually use that same recipe and just add about an ounce of vodka. That's gonna give you actually some cleaning um, power so you can use this as a household cleaner. And uh, so again, adding the 20 to 30 drops of essential oil to a spray bottle um, with a few ounces of water, distilled water and an ounce of vodka. 
shake before you use and then you can use it on again your countertops and tables and that sort of thing now I always tell people with any essential oil that you're using for the first time you want to make sure to do a patch test before applying to the body so a patch test is really simple you just take a drop of whatever essential oil you want to use and just um, put it on the inside of the wrist and wait about an hour or so to see if you get a reaction. So a reaction would look like, you know, any redness or hives or a rash. If that happens, then you're sensitive to that essential oil and obviously should not use it. However, if nothing develops, um, the oil should be safe to use in the proper amounts. So I hope you like my my brief uh, story on essential oils, and they're just one of the many tools that we utilize to help clients here at Total Health. Because each client is unique, we use different techniques to customize the care that we provide to our clients. Some of these tools, again, include nutrition, muscle testing, boot opal scanning, and neurofeedback. So it is our job to help you improve your health through guidance, education, and support. If you're ready for the next step and have some questions or would like to discuss your health concerns, I'm offering a complimentary 15-minute phone consult to help you get some direction and answers. You can call our front desk at 262-251-2929 to set up your free phone consult. So thanks again for watching. Have a great night. Hi everyone, my name is Mona Everly and I'm one of the naturopathic practitioners and nutritional therapists here at Total Health and I truly have the awesome job of helping people like you get their health back on track again using natural medicine. And today I'm going to talk about digestive health and the connection to a strong immune system. So I'm glad that you can join me and I'm going to switch over to a slide presentation now which will make things more visible and easier to follow. So let's get started. As Hippocrates said over 2,000 years ago, all disease begins in the gut, and I like to add, so does good health. If you learn how to keep your gut healthy by changing your diet and lifestyle practices, you will automatically support your immune system, and these changes can and will transform your health for the better. So may I ask you, do you listen to your body? Pain and discomfort are the only way your body can tell you that something is not right, so tune in. If you suffer from any of the following complaints, such as nausea, heartburn, bloating, gas, stomach pain, and constipation, your body is trying to tell you something. Please don't ignore or simply medicate your symptoms away. If your digestive system is not working correctly, it will weaken your immune system. Did you know that almost 80% of your immune system is located all along your digestive system? The reason for this is that most of our invaders, be they viruses, parasites, bacteria, fungus, and even toxins enter through our mouth, and it is our immune system that block them from entering our bloodstream. And this is where your immune system starts its job. So what do you need to do? If you guessed chewing, you are right. Actually, your mom was right. You need to chew your food at least 30 times, making sure that it's liquid before you swallow. I guess that's why we have teeth. Chewing is our first line of defense. By chewing, we activate powerful immune cells and enzymes in our mouth that destroy pathogens that enter with our food. And it sets us up for good digestion, as most of our carbohydrates are broken down in the mouth. If you don't liquefy your carbs, they potentially can cause bloating and gas further down the track. Not only is chewing important, but the type of foods you decide to eat is crucial. Sugar, refined carbs, and grain sabotage your immune system. And when I talk about sugar, I really mean all foods that break down into sugar in your bloodstream. 
Statistically, 70% of the foods that we eat are ultra processed. We consume the equivalent of over 40 teaspoons of sugar a day. And guess what? Sugar suppresses the immune system. Most people are aware that eating foods that break down to sugar increase the risk for obesity and diabetes. However, most don't know that sugar-laden foods also have an effect on our immune system. A big impact at that. Immune function decreases for hours after sugar is consumed. A research study done, done by Loma Linda University in which participants were fed different forms of sugar found that the effectiveness of white blood cells, those cells that if fight immune infections, decreased up to 50% after one to two hours after eating sugar, lasting up to five hours. Yikes. In other words, people that eat lots of sugary foods are more likely to get sick. Bad fats are treacherous too. Hydrogenated fats, trans fats, and damaged plant oils such as canola, sunflower, safflower, soybean, and corn oil, any oil that comes in a big yellow bottle are toxic to our immune system and suppress cellular function. This is what you are consuming when you eat out in fast food restaurants and when you choose to eat packaged and prepared foods. I always tell my clients, go get an oil change switch to nuts, to seeds, olive and olive oil, butter, avocado and avocado oil, and oily fish. Your immune system will thank you. Food intolerances are another challenge to your digestive system and immune system. In order to protect you, the body makes IgG antibodies to attack the offending food, but in doing so, you are creating a lot of inflammation in your cells. The problem with food intolerances is that they are difficult to identify, as your reaction may be delayed up to 72 hours. That means you could eat an egg that you're intolerant to on Tuesday and not react until Friday. If you suspect you may have food intolerances, I would highly recommend you do one of our food intolerance tests. My clients have had wonderful symptom relief just simply by eliminating their particular food intolerances. Next, let's talk about stomach acid, as this is a very confusing topic. Unlike popular belief, most of us produce too little and not too much stomach acid, especially as we get older. We think we have high acid because we get heartburn, but more than 70% of the time, it's because we don't have enough stomach acid, which stops the little valve between your throat and stomach from sealing properly, allowing acid to seep upwards. And when we're very quick to take antacid, yep, those little purple pills, those only make the problems worse. Producing too little stomach acid allows pathogens to survive in your stomach and continue to journey through the digestive system. They can enter our bloodstream, putting our immune system on high alert. It also prevents us from properly digesting our food and putting us at risk for nutrient deficiencies. Medications, food intolerances, stress, age, bacterial overgrowth, all interfere with adequate stomach acid production. It's a very common problem and probably the issue I help my clients with most. In our clinic, I will often have my clients do a simple baking soda test, or affectionately called the burp test, to give us an indication of stomach acid production. I'd be happy to send this out to you if you email or call me at Total Health. So once you know you have too little stomach acid, there are natural ways you can aid your stomach, improve your digestion, increase nutrient absorption, and protect your immune system. First and foremost, avoid drinking with meals. This only dilutes your gastric juices and renders it less effective. Also, only eat when you're relaxed. Stress shuts down digestion and sets you up for acid reflux and bloating. Drink the juice of half a lemon diluted in four ounces of water half an hour before your meal. This will help to increase stomach acidity naturally. And if you don't like 
lemon juice, you can also try apple cider vinegar as an alternative. Other digestive stimulants include ginger and dandelion root tea. You can drink anywhere between two to three cups a day. Good old fashioned bitters. Not the alcoholic variety, please. Or even just a handful of bitter greens like arugula or watercress before a meal can be very effective to get things going. So in addition to experimenting with all of the digestive stimulants that we just discussed in the previous slide, I do recommend that most of my clients take a digestive enzyme. You know, the majority of us just don't make enough stomach acid or enzymes to properly digest our food, to sterilize our food, and also to break the proteins down into their smallest components, the amino acids, so that we can absorb and utilize all of our nutrients. Uh, now, there are many, many different types of um, enzymes on the market. Again, very, very confusing. Um, but this is where we can really, really help you if you come in and we can evaluate what's going on in your digestive system and pick the appropriate enzymes for you. Your liver and gallbladder are also key to your digestive wellness and strong immunity. Your liver makes and the gallbladder stores bile. During digestion, bile is released into the small intestine to help us break down and emulsify the fats in our foods so they can be absorbed. If fats are not emulsified, they pass through our digestive tract and often cause symptoms similar to IBS and chronic diarrhea. Emulsified fats transport the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K. These nutrients play an important role in supporting our immune system. Bile continues to travel through the colon binding toxins such as spent estrogens, pesticides, herbicides, and medication byproducts and getting them ready to be eliminated. To improve fat metabolism, remove the inflammatory fats, eat bile healthy foods such as greens, cruciferous vegetables, beets, eggs, and citrus fruits, use digestive enzymes and make sure you are well hydrated. Because our digestive system is our main entry point for pathogens and toxins, we have a whole host of bacteria in our digestive system that work alongside our immune system to keep us healthy. We live in synergy with bacteria. A hundred trillion alone live in our gut. It is bacteria that train in our immune system in the first two years of our life and keep us strong throughout our lifetime. When we are ill, bacteria stimulate our immune system protect us by secreting antimicrobial chemicals and support the mucosal immunity, which helps block viral entry. Our bacteria reduce inflammation markers and they can help reduce respiratory illnesses. Very important at this time. Amazing, amazing when you think about all of the things they do for us. Unfortunately, most of us have too many of the bad bacteria in our gut and not enough of the good ones. This is primarily because we are addicted to junk food, especially the processed carbs and grains that turn into sugar in our body. You are literally feeding the bad guys and letting them take over. The ideal ratio is about 85 good and 15 bad. We need a few of the bad guys to keep our good guys on their toes. Unfortunately, Many of us have this ratio reversed and are suffering the consequences with digestive symptoms and a compromised immune system. There are two ways to change the dynamic in your gut and help your good guys rule. One is by eating healthy bacteria regularly. I recommend two tablespoons a day. Good choices are fermented vegetables like sauerkraut, kimchi, and pickles. And for those of you that tolerate dairy, Yogurt and kefir are an excellent option. Personally, I love coconut kefir. The second way is to increase, to increase the good guys is to feed them and guess what they like. Vegetables, especially those containing resistant fibers such as onions, garlic, leek, asparagus, jicama, chicory, and cruciferous vegetables. Another option is to get a probiotic supplement. There are three classes of probiotics currently and mixing them up is a good idea. Most of us have heard of Acidophilus and Bifidobacterium found in most, of most probiotic supplements. 
Less known and hugely beneficial are the bacillus or soil-based organisms that help promote immune function, specifically our T regulatory cells that control our immune response. Then there's, there is Saccharomyces boulardii, actually a beneficial yeast that is often found in probiotic supplements that help to counter yeast overgrowth in the body. There's also a new kid on the block called a postbiotic. These supplements directly feed the good guys in our colon. It's a confusing world in the supplement industry. How do you know which probiotic is going to be best for you? Again, this is where a visit to the clinic can be immensely helpful as we can help you navigate your choices with all supplements. No conversation on digestion and immune function would be complete until we address intestinal permeability or leaky gut syndrome as it is a major factor in nearly every inflammation condition. Leaky gut occurs when the cells of the intestinal lining lose their tight connection, allowing everything from undigested foods, pathogens, and toxins to leak into our bloodstream. This causes our immune system to go into a state of high alert to make antibodies and to ignite autoimmunity and disease. Leaky gut has many causes, including food intolerances, stress, medications, poor stomach acid production, and pathogenic infections. If you suffer from symptoms such as skin problems, joint pain, asthma, sinus congestion, digestive complaints, headaches, and fatigue, these can all be early signs of autoimmunity. Healing a leaky gut is tricky and takes time, as there are many causes for leaky gut, and each person needs to figure out their particular triggers. In our naturopathic world, we have a simple formula to keep us to help us navigate the healing process. It's called weed, feed, and seed. So we start with weeding or removing the big offenders, be they food intolerances, pathogens, or stress. Feeding refers to giving the body the nutrients it needs to repair the gut lining. And finally, seeding allows us to rebalance the good gut bacteria that keep us healthy. There are lots of wonderful products in the market to help speed along the healing process. And we have to end this presentation with being regular. Nothing retoxes the body than being chronically constipated. Constipation is defined as having less than three bowel movements a week, but in my book, having less than one a day puts your immune system and body under stress. When you don't go, you re reabsorb all the toxins, waste, spent hormones that your body has worked really hard to eliminate. Things that constipate us include too many bad guys in your gut, food intolerances, stress, and medications. The best ways to ensure good bowel movements is to drink water throughout the day, eat a high-fiber vegetable diet, eat healthy fats to lubricate your digestive system, and to exercise regularly. So let's do a quick summary on some steps you can take to support your digestion and immune system. First, always listen to your body. Remember, symptoms are your body's way of getting your attention. Chew your food well. Avoid foods that drive inflammation and put your immune system in overdrive. Processed carbs, dangerous fats, and your particular food intolerances. Ensure optimal stomach acid and bile production. Eat and feed your good gut bacteria. Heal and seal your leaky gut. And be regular. So if you have long-standing digestive and immune issues, know that we are here to help. We have a proven system to actually identify your specific triggers. We use diet and lifestyle intervention, whole food concentrates, supplements such as herbal and homeopathic supplements to help you improve your symptoms naturally. Please feel free to call us for a free 15-minute consultation. Thank you so much for tuning in. I look forward to helping you get your health back on track again using natural methods. Take care.
Well, hello, welcome to this uh, portion of the Immune Seminar. Uh, my name is Marty Johnson. I'm founder of Total Health Nutrition Center. And I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about detoxification and immune health. Uh, one thing I want you to know, I'm gonna be showing you different, the science behind you know, why uh, immune function can be affected by toxicity and so forth. But I'm gonna be showing you, uh, or the things that I'm gonna be showing you also are gonna to apply to other things that you could be dealing with. So even though this is on immune and detoxification, it can really, it's gonna go further to um, really apply it to a lot of other things like low energy and brain fog and different hormone issues, even thyroid issues, things of that nature. So I don't want you to just feel like you're just gonna to get toxicity uh, information, but um, it's really gonna go further out from that. So getting into our talk here, we're gonna be talking about um, really just toxicity in general, and um, it is really ubiquitous in our environment, uh, meaning that there's, it's, it's everywhere. There's over 80,000 different toxins that have been you know, chemicals registered um, in the United States. Uh, anything from cigarette smoke to household cleaning products to personal care products, uh, actually, there was a study showing that the average woman that is using, uh, by the time she gets out of the house um, with the things that she's putting on her body and, and through personal care, she's exposed to almost 120 different chemicals uh, by the time she even gets ready in the morning, which is kind of uh, astounding. But um, heavy metals, pesticides, um, pollutants in our water, uh, even radiation toxicity from x-rays or procedures that people have, might have gotten done, or even surgeries with um, toxins from uh, anesthesia and all the other medications that go along with that. So the point is, is that really, you know, there's a lot of toxins that we're exposed to. Um, really, even there's a study showing that um, even people that don't live near industrial sites uh, they have found up to 160 different, 167 different chemicals in their body, uh, even though they don't live near an industrial site. So there's a lot of things that, even though you think you might be, you know, protected, uh, we're still exposed to stuff. But really, toxins can, as they accumulate or bioaccumulate in the body, uh, they actually get pushed into different parts of the body. The body will sort of push them into different parts of the body to protect itself, like into the fat stores, into the bone, um, like lead toxicity we find oftentimes deep in the bone because the body needs to shove it somewhere where it's not as threatened as much. But also um, into the fat stores, a lot of toxins are pushed into those tissues because um, it's less threatening than in the organs in that sense. But um, really, toxins as they accumulate can um, end up causing anything from skin issues to fatigue to sleep disorders to digestion, joint discomfort. Anywhere these toxins will um, collect, um, ultimately they can start to create problems for different tissues. Why is that? Because as these toxins collect in different areas, the immune system is going after those toxins trying to protect you. But if the toxins, if the immune system can't deal with that, after a while the immune system will dysregulate and start going after the tissue itself, creating inflammation. And um, as that immune system works at trying to deal with that, it becomes overburdened so that if you, you know, get whatever, get a sickness or a virus, now the immune system is burdened on other issues like toxicities more so than just trying to protect your body. So that's how toxins can affect the immune system indirectly. But when we talk about detoxification, we're really looking at, it's a, it's a wonderful platform as a tool to sort of like, I call it a reset button, meaning that um, it can become a great springboard to kind of launch your health um, you know, in a different direction. So um, detoxification and doing different programs, which I'm gonna show you today, can be a great tool or springboard to launch your health into a whole different direction and, and work on various aspects of your health. So when it comes to toxicity, I like to always go down to the cellular level because 
dealing with um, toxins on a cellular level starts to show us how prolific or how these um, how toxins can affect us in many many different ways. So I'd like to illustrate that for you uh, on a whiteboard. Um, you see the, the the slide in front of you talking about cell, you know, or basically showing you a cell. Well, I'm going to do a feeble attempt here to pretty much just draw a cell, and then we can talk a little bit about it. Okay. So um, we'll start with a circle, and um, it might look more like an egg, but we'll call it a circle. And um, so every, the cells in your body actually have a, an outer wall or membrane, and it's a bilayer membrane. So basically it's a dual fatty membrane made up of cholesterol, believe it or not. And this houses your cell, and within the cell there's DNA. Um, if some of you maybe have seen one of my seminars on thyroid health, and I, we probably went through this, I'm going to do this more for the purpose of detoxification and immune health, of course. Uh, within your cells, you have these little power plants. They're called mitochondria. You don't have to remember that, but uh, we'll just talk about it in that respect. And within this mitochondria, there's a chemical reaction going on called the Krebs cycle. <clears throat> Ultimately, the Krebs cycle or that chemical reaction is producing a byproduct or an end product, which is every living organism's energy, which is ATP, okay? Adenidine triphosphate is the energy that's outputted from the cells, from the mitochondria. And within the outer wall of the cell, you have these receptors that actually are like docking stations for your hormones, like your T3 for your thyroid hormone or insulin or leptin. Um, if you want to lose weight, you have to be able, the cell has to hear leptin. And, in, and it also needs to, your cells need to actually receive vitamins and minerals because how else are you going to get fuel to fuel these power plants, okay? So what can happen is various toxins from the environment, some more prolific than others, meaning that some toxins actually attach to fatty tissue, like heavy metals, mercury, um, lead, things like that can attach to fatty tissue and actually, um, obviously we said this is cholesterol, so, so toxins can attach to this tissue here and create um, inflammation on the cell membrane. So other chemicals, um, uh, BPAs, dioxins, phthalates from plastics, BPAs from cosmetics, um, different uh, pesticides that are all over the place, we know that Glyphosate, which is a pest, which is a chemical that's actually in Roundup, is everywhere. Um, all of these types of things can attach to the cell membrane potentially and cause inflammation. And as the cell membrane inflames, it actually starts to oxidize the cell membrane. Okay, and that oxidation is a breaking down process. It's certainly not building up process, just like rust to a car. As this oxidizes. You can see where this might actually blunt these receptors, okay? So this is where you can actually have normal blood levels of hormones, so insulin or T3 or leptin. They can look normal in your bloodstream, but yet your cells aren't hearing them as well. So you're not responding them to them as well. So this is where you go to your doctor and they tell you everything looks normal and you're fine, you're just getting older, and you're going, no, I know how I should feel. And um, therefore, now we have a situation where your doctor's telling you one thing and you're, not, you're feeling another, and this is why. This is exactly why, okay? So what I want to show you for the purpose of this seminar is that if this is happening, guess what? You're not getting as much fuel to your power plants. So you're, as, as you're getting less vitamin miner, mineral into the, the cell to, to feed this, this uh, mitochondria, guess what, that lowers your ATP production, okay? And it actually takes, it takes one, or it takes three molecules of ATP to equal one molecule of a substance called glutathione. And glutathione is a substance that your, your body is producing, your cells are producing. It's, it's an antioxidant, so it protects you, your cells. It, it protects your DNA. So, Glutathione can protect your DNA as an antioxidant, but it's an expensive molecule. It takes three ATP molecules to equal one glutathione molecule. Well, guess what? If we start to reduce our fuel supply, 
lower our ATP, now we just lowered our glutathione production by three times, okay? And as we lower our glutathione production, which is your antioxidants, by the way, vitamin C is an antioxidant, and that's a pretty good antioxidant. Glutathione is 5,000 times stronger than vitamin C is an antioxidant, okay? So as we lower our glutathione, now our DNA is less protected. So you know, some of these toxins are gonna get in regardless, especially as the cell membrane is affected. And if these toxins affect your DNA, they're either gonna damage DNA or they're gonna mutate DNA. So my question is, which one would you rather have? As weird as it sounds, I'd rather actually have damaged DNA because that's just more rapid aging versus mutated DNA, which is potentially cancer, or something of that nature, okay? So what we have to look at here is as this ATP production is dropping and as your DNA is more vulnerable, okay, <clears throat> what happens is, is that the overall mitochondria is actually slowing down. And, and as this slows down, it actually allows your cells to take on more toxins. So um, when the mitochondria is producing good energy, it's actually able to you know, kick out or re, you know, kick more toxins out of the cell. But if that energy is slowing down, now your cells can take on more toxins potentially, potentially excuse me. And when that happens, um, things start to kind of implode on itself, meaning that we call it your bucket can start to tip, where the person's health starts to really diminish because the body has taken on too many toxins. So this is really the crux of what we have to look at, and this is what we deal with in our office many times. We do what's called a medioxy test, which is a urine test that can show us 50 times more accurate, accurately than blood work if this cell membrane is actually getting inflamed. So in our initial visits in our office, we always do a medioxy test. We can get that result right away. It's a urine test in office. We can get right away to tell us if that's going on because if it is going on, then we can start to do the investigation on which toxins might be driving that inflammation. And now we can actually start to figure out how to deal with that, okay? So going further into this talk, I'm gonna show you more of a general detoxification process that we take um, but even then, it really, really helps to get guidance on that, and I'm gonna show you why, okay? So let's move on to our talk, and we're gonna basically try to figure out <clears throat> where to go from here, okay? So as we move on, we're gonna talk about the liver, and there's three different phases, or actually, we're gonna talk about the liver, but we're gonna just talk about three phases overall of detoxification, okay? Um, so really, metabolic detoxification provides your body with additional nutritional support that it may need to actually help your body metabolize and expel toxins safely. So the cell that we talked about, we need to add you know, key specific support to the body so that the cells can actually strengthen, things that can actually get that mitochondria functioning more efficiently and things that can protect your DNA again. So the the, the liver is a big part of, of these phases, especially the phase one and phase two liver detoxification process, we call it, okay? And this particular screen here just kind of gives you an illustration of the phase one and phase two. Just p kind of think of it as a oil filter, if you will. But phase one actually is all about the oxidation of harmful toxins in order to break them down into less harmful water-soluble metabolites. So we want to get these toxins into a form that the body can actually start to deal with, okay? The interesting thing is, though, in phase one, when we start to break down and oxidize those toxins into a water-soluble substance, that toxin called a primary substance is actually way, way more toxic than the original toxin. So why is that important? Well, it's important to know that because if we're not properly detoxing and you're not getting the guidance in how to detox, if phase two, which we're gonna talk about, isn't handling that primary substance, it's actually gonna be more damaging to your DNA and to your liver than the original toxin was. So it's critical that this whole thing is done the right way, okay? 
I call it you know, when detoxification becomes dangerous. So if it's not done right, it actually can cause more damage. Phase two is actually to help neutralize that primary substance or highly toxic substance and uh, convert it into even a more non-toxic molecule that is even more water soluble. So now the body can start to deal with it once phase two has done its job. And that's where the liver really has done its work. And then we start to move into phase three, which is in all of the other eliminatory organs, things like the kidneys and the lymphatic system, the lungs, and um, your skin is actually one of the biggest organs, your bowel, all of those things. So we have to make sure that we're supporting all these other systems so that these eliminatory channels can get rid of these toxins after phase one and two have been um, completed, okay? Because we don't want to, for instance, like if your bowels aren't working properly, then you're just gonna end up recirculating these toxins and you're gonna cause problems and brain fog and all kinds of stuff like that. So preparing for the journey of a detoxification process Actually, um, we, we want to look at very specific things so that we're not, uh, not, we're not missing something that might be super important for you, okay? So this is where a lot of times working with a practitioner can be super helpful because we're going to be asking these questions and then making sure that if they are an issue for you that we're addressing them before we even start you on an aggressive detoxification process. So do you struggle with constipation? I already mentioned that. Do you get excessive bloating after you eat? Um, you know, do you have a heavier feeling in your stomach after a moderate meal? In other words, it feel kind of like a rock in your stomach for a longer period of time. Or has your gallbladder been removed? These are all important things. So um, you know, if you're, again, if your bowel is not moving, we need to figure out why that is and how we can improve that. Excessive bloating after eating, um, that can oftentimes be, there's a lot of different symptoms that can relate to a gallbladder that's inefficient. So I find this a lot in my practice where people, they can have test after test after test medically, but actually have a gallbladder where the bile is not moving as well. So the bile actually gets thicker due to certain toxins affecting um, the liver, because the, the liver produces bile and that moves into the gallbladder, which is kind of a, a pouch that holds that bile, so that when food leaves your stomach and goes into the beginning of your small intestines called the duodenum, that triggers your gallbladder to squeeze some bile in there, okay, to digest fats. But if that bile is too thick, you can't squeeze, it's not going to move. And when you don't have bile helping you, your digestion, you're going to feel bloated, sometimes even after eating a very light meal or a snack or even drinking water. It can be crazy. You can have discomfort on your right side or even radiating to right underneath the cartilage under your sternum there called the xiphoid process. People can have issues where they have tightness between the shoulder blades, kind of like almost like a muscle cramp that never seems to go away, or they can actually have issues where they get headaches in the temple area of their head, um, pain in their, like, soreness or stiffness in the neck that doesn't seem to resolve. These can all be symptoms of an inefficient gallbladder. The reason I'm mentioning it is because I see it so much, and we can help people with this. We all, we've helped people over the years many, many times. Actually, there's a client of mine, her name is K uh, Kathy, but she, she actually um, had her gallbladder removed and still had all the same symptoms because her original issue wasn't, it wasn't the gallbladder function, it was actually the fact that her, her bile was so thick that it wasn't moving from the gallbladder, okay? So when they remove the gallbladder, you still have a bile duct. If that bile is too th thick, it's still not gonna move properly. So she still had the, the tightness between her shoulder blades and the bloating after meals. And this was like five years after her gallbladder was taken out. Once I started working with her, changing her diet, and also getting her on the right herbs and different substances that could thin that bile out, almost all of her symptoms went away, okay? So these are things that uh, we, we often see um, people suffer with, and they're told everything's fine, and it's not fine. And um, so these are important things to address. Some people might just have heaviness in their stomach or even um, GERD or reflux because they're actually not producing enough of the hydrochloric acid. So 
Toxins can affect the cells that produce hydrochloric acid in the stomach lining. So if you're producing less hydrochloric acid, you're actually not gonna break down your proteins as well. So some people can actually feel like the, the food's sitting in their stomach longer because they're not digesting it quick enough. And if it stays in there too long, those proteins will actually start to putrefy and then you get rancid acids coming up. So it's actually the very reason why they're getting reflux. And then doctors want to give, you know, antacids or tell you to take Tums or different, you know, Nexiums to suppress that acid. Well, the problem is, yeah, it might make you feel better, but you're suppressing more of your good hydrochloric acid and it's just perpetuating the problem. So these are areas that we need to look at before going on a cleanse or making sure we're doing the right things. Other areas that we like to look at um, is to, to really determine, okay, what, what requirements for your, um, your weight, um, you know, how much protein should you be consuming do it during your program? Do you have diet, other dietary concerns like glucose or blood sugar management issues that we want to really consider before going on a cleanse? Um, but we really, um, we work hand in hand with people to customize a plan, okay? I'm not suggesting that you can't do a cleanse on your own, but I'm just kind of showing you a path of how we work with people. Also, you know, coffee and alcohol, um, off, you know, for the most part, if you're doing really a, a proper cleanse, it's good to take those out during the process of a cleanse. And um, so these are areas where we need to oftentimes walk people through and work with them to make sure they're not getting too much or they're, they're, they're getting enough time to actually wean off of the caffeine or what have you so that they can do this cleanse without having a massive headache when they get going on it, okay? And other aspects of the duration of a detoxification, so some people you know, they might decide, or hey, a two-week cleanse, you know, or, or even the practitioner might decide a two-week cleanse is sufficient. Oftentimes, a three-week three -week cleanse is the best because it takes about 21 days to break habits. This is from research. So oftentimes, we like to run people at least three weeks and, and sometimes longer. Um, so these are things that we can determine based on, um, you know, people's health goals, how much weight they might want to lose, or their detoxification survey, symptom survey, that we'll talk about at the end of this seminar. So when we're talking about um, detoxification, I'm gonna just kinda show you or, or talk to you a little bit about one particular product that we use, and we do other, other types of cleanses and detoxification products, but for the simplicity of doing a seminar like this, I wanna just talk to you about a product called SP Detox Balance. And this is a program that is very, very good. One of the reasons we like it is because it's a complete 100% whole food product in one shake. So this product actually used to be in multiple products where you're taking up to 21 different capsules in a day in addition to a shake. Um, so the brilliant thing with this product is they've actually combined it all into one shake that actually tastes, tastes good. It's actually a chai flavor. People can add other flavors. They can add a little bit of organic cocoa powder and unsweetened, of course, to change the flavor a little bit. Um, but an all-in-one shake, it just sort of eliminates a lot of hassles comes with a booklet that kind of guides you through different recipes and, and different information. Usually as a practitioner, we're guiding people in addition, you know, along with that and showing you what you need to be doing, as well as testing your body for these other things. Um, it's very safe. It really supports all three phases of detoxification. There's no synthetic ingredients. Um, it is completely organic um, and Again, practitioners usually guide people through this particular type of cleanse. Um, really, the, the whole food aspect of it is the unique part, meaning that when you get uh, true whole food nutrients that are grown right on site, that high, high nutrient content is what makes it effective in allowing that phase one and phase two to work properly and getting the right combination in there. This particular product actually has human clinical uh, trials for effectiveness. What does that mean? It means that it's actually been clinically proven um, with, with humans to actually 
uh, effectively uh, activate phase one, phase two, and phase three. So that's significant because there's very, very few products out there that have human clinical trials to it. Um, and it's really been approved by nutrition scientists, which is a, this is a great thing. So the, the last segment of this talk, I wanna talk about some other benefits of detoxification. So gut health, brain health, and weight loss resistance. These are big areas that I find oftentimes people have concerns with. I've done this type of thing with um, holistic medicine and working with people one-on-one -on -one for over 30 years. So I've seen a lot of patterns and I've seen a lot of things over the times, okay? Um, and these are some of the bigger ones that people have concerns with. Why gut health? Well, because of the way that food has been altered, meaning that even the grain has been genetically modified, um, it's been hybridized so that it will grow in all kinds of different environments. And that's all great if you can produce bigger crops. The problem is, is that it's come at a huge cost. So uh, you hear a lot about gluten. A lot of people think, well, that's just a fad that we're all talking about is gluten. And now we're saying everyone has that problem. Well, no, it's, it's, the fact is, is that gluten is five times higher in the current grain we have that's been hybridized than the original grain that we started with, which is called einkorn. So um, the ancient grain had five times less gluten as the grains we have nowadays, okay? Gluten is the protein that's in wheat, and when we get high amounts of that, it becomes very inflammatory in our bodies and in the gut, okay? And your intestinal tract is like a tightly bound, um, it's called tight junctions, okay? And you can see in the picture that these junctions should be tight together, okay? Not like in the middle where it's opened up, okay? That's, that's a junction that's actually been opened up. So if there's inflammation in the gut, it's kind of like a net that's been stretched out. And now we have, you know, things sieving through, nutrients or toxins sieving through from your gut into the bloodstream that were never meant to be there. And what happens? Your immune system, which is designed to protect you, goes after those things like a baseball bat, like, you, like if you were you know, going after a robber that's coming through your window with a baseball bat. So the immune system is going after those toxins that shouldn't be there, and it's trying to protect you. But if those are continually getting into your system, the immune system is continually going after it which is in itself an, an inflammatory process, okay? And if the immune system is going after those things enough, it keeps damaging more and more of those junctions and you have what we call leaky gut, okay? Eventually these toxins can get into, throughout your body, through your bloodstream, into your joints, causing more inflammation and the immune system goes after that. And that's where you can develop an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis if the immune system is going after the tissue and the joint because it's trying to clean up toxins. Or you can develop colitis or Crohn's. A lot of times people think that these are all, auto or all um, strictly inherited or you know, things that you just were passed on to you genetically. That's not always the case. A lot of times they're caused from the toxicities that are getting in the body. And as I said earlier, if, the, if your immune system is working on these toxins, it's diverting some of that process so it, your immune system is lowering and you may not even know it. You may not even realize it at the time, but your immune system and your defense systems are starting to get diminished. And you know, if something comes along that threatens you, uh, you may be at much more risk unless you start to get rid of these toxins and start to heal these tissues, okay? The good news is, is that Leaky gut can be healed, and one of the first places to start with is a proper detoxification. Um, the bad news is, is that if you're dealing with leaky gut, which a huge amount of Americans are, you also have a, a protection mechanism in the blood vessels in your brain called the blood-brain barrier, okay? And those, uh, those vessels have a similar junction that uh, keeps your brain from taking on toxins. So all of us are gonna take on toxins in our body. We can't live in a bubble, right? We're gonna take on some of them, and God has given us a defense mechanism of different eliminatory channels to handle a certain amount of toxins. It's just that when our bucket, our body gets too full, 
then we start to actually become more at risk, okay? But uh, the brain can't take a lot of toxins, so you, you're actually been given a blood-brain barrier. But if the interesting thing is, is that this tight junction or these junctions in the blood-brain barrier are the exact same material as in your gut. So if you have leaky gut going on, which a lot of people do, you actually are developing leaky brain. So the, the things are breaking down in that blood-brain barrier, allowing toxins into the brain that shouldn't be there, which can slowly start to diminish um, you know, the brain function, um, short-term memory or just remembering things. It's gonna be subtle at first. It might be, hey, I'm walking into rooms forgetting things like, a, you know, like a, I never did before or what have you. Or maybe just more brain fog and things of that nature. Oftentimes when we do the proper detox and these types of barriers start to heal, people notice that they have less brain fog, they think clearer, things start to improve, which is great, okay? Um, this is becoming a big issue. Um, different doctors that I've talked to, medical doctors that have done a lot of research on leaky gut and things like that, are saying that in the next 10 years, um, we might see almost on the lines of one in four kids born somewhere on the autism spectrum scale because it's affecting the brains from this leaky gut stuff. And also, um, it's estimated that right now as we speak, over almost 36 million people are currently living with some kind of dementia worldwide. And um, actually the numbers on here are probably a little outdated, but really in the next 20 years, probably less than that, we're gonna see that number go tremendously higher, 120 million people might be dealing with some form of dementia. And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't wanna go there. That's the, the, the last thing that I uh, wanna deal with in that respect, um, is starting to lose my memory and things like that. The last thing I wanna leave you with is something that can be super frustrating for people. And it's what I call weight loss resistance. So you've heard of insulin resistance before, that's type two diabetes. Well, people can develop weight loss resistance. And uh, what does that mean? Well, remember I had mentioned to you with our drawing here that leptin, you can't lose weight if your cells can't read leptin, okay? And um, so if, if these cell membranes are becoming inflamed and leptin can't be heard, that's, that's like weight loss resistance. And um, furthermore, because of different stressors or toxins in the body, there's a gland in the brain called the hypothalamus. Um, so a lot of people, if they've done a lot of yo-yo dieting or women that have gone through menopause, these little stressors or even different traumas, an accident or a heavy stress event in your life can actually create a situation where we call it hypothalamic dysfunction. That's where the hypothalamus isn't regulating quite as well and it's not telling your body to burn fat off of your, off of your fat stores, okay? There's very, very specific processes that we can do to get that hypothalamus actually regulating again. But more specifically in relation to this talk, if toxins are being shoved into fat stores, remember I had mentioned that earlier, so if toxins are being shoved into fat stores, what happens is, is that your body is an amazing mechanism. I mean, literally, your body will do whatever it can to keep you functioning, okay? And to keep you as, as safe as possible. So. Oftentimes, people when when they when they want to detox, you know, are out of you know tox, toxic fat. Okay, so if you have toxins in the fat, the body will not release those toxins because the body is perceiving basically that as a danger. So it becomes actually this this vicious cycle where if we don't get those toxins out of the fat the body will not want to burn fat, okay? So, because when the body burns fat, it's actually releasing huge amounts of toxins. And um, so we, a lot of times, have to gently start to help the body get these toxins out of the fat stores so that the body can actually, the metabolism can start to kick in and go, all right, well, now it's safe to start burning fat, okay? But... You know, if you're just trying to lose weight without doing proper detoxification, the body's gonna actually wanna hold on to that fat because it doesn't wanna release toxins too quickly. So I hope that makes sense to you, but it's almost like this mechanism that's trying to protect you, but it's not allowing you to lose weight, which can be super frustrating. I see it all the time. 
we've, we've helped many, many people with this weight loss resistance issue. Um, some of these processes do take a very careful um, medical, what I call a medical researched approach to doing the right things at the right time to allow the body to start releasing toxins slowly so the body can start burning fat. So this is a topic that I thought would be a good place to end that a lot of people are interested in knowing more about. And with that being said, if you are interested in getting some help with any of these areas of detoxification or weight loss or brain fog and all of these types of things, please, please take us up on this offer. Really, you know, calling us, um, give us a call, 262-251-2929. We're offering a free or no charge phone consult with one of our practitioners, no obligation. We'll talk with you about your issues, your concerns, your symptoms. And you know what, if it's a, if it's a right fit for you, we'll let you know if it's a right fit. Um, then, you know, then we can first talk about how we can work with you, okay? Either virtually or, or in office, however you would wish. You can also go to our website at www.totalhealthinc.com and there um, you can basically email us and say, hey, I'm requesting a you know, phone consult or what have you. You can do it either way but we are here to serve you and to help you. That is our mission, is to serve people so that they can live better and enjoy the life that, that God really um, has for you or designed for you. So thank you very much, and um, I look forward to seeing you on further uh, podcasts or web webinars. Well, we welcome you. This is the last segment of our immune seminar series, and we want to thank you for watching that series. Um, I have Mona here with me, and uh, we've had people uh, basically, uh, you know, bring, tell us have some questions that they've submitted to us on uh, on this whole series, and um, so this particular segment is to really answer some of those questions so that you can all. Um, you know, hear those questions and get, get a good answer. And um, Mona and I are going to just take turns going through these questions and hopefully giving you a good answer. How's that sound? Sounds good, Marty. All Shall right. we get started? Good, yeah. So uh, if, um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start with the first question that we had submitted. Um, and that one actually has to do with food intolerances. So this particular question was you know, food intolerances and the immune system, which was discussed a little bit, I mean, how, how to figure out those food intolerances? How, how does that all work? And, and how do we even get to that, um, you know, end result of figuring that stuff out? Yeah, thanks, Marty. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually something that I do talk about in my PowerPoint presentation, um, but it's a really un, um, important topic to understand in terms of our immune function. Um, the first thing I want to just say is that there is a big difference between allergies and food intolerances that I just want to clear up firsthand. Now, an allergy to a food, we tend to know right away because um, the immune sy system responds quite quickly. Um, you know, we can very, very quickly develop a rash and irritation, right. itchiness, um, and even swelling and inflammation sure. in response to a food. Whereas food intolerances are much more difficult and, and quite complicated actually to, to figure out. Um, I always give the example of somebody being intolerant to eggs, eating an egg on Tuesday and not responding with symptoms on, until Friday. So you can have as much as 72 hour mm -hmm. delay between your actual uh, symptom, the, eating the food and the time that lapses before you actually develop the symptoms. The symptoms are also quite wide ranging. Um, you can develop anything from headaches, migraines, brain fog, skin conditions such as uh, eczema, um, psoriasis, uh, acne, quite common. Um, digestive issues obviously are very, very common. Joint pain, muscle pain, 
uh, fatigue is very common and even e- emotional issues as well um, sure. everything from yeah. anxiety to depression irritability are very common symptoms of food intolerances and food intolerances pose a huge risk to the immune system you know the immune system will respond immediately right. um, in the form of developing antibodies to the particular food and will launch an offensive and in doing so, you're creating a lot of inflammation in the body, and we obviously don't want that to happen. The immune system has enough to do, enough challenges yeah. to deal with. So one of the things that we recommend when we're suspicious of clients having a lot of food intolerances is, is that they do a test. And we have a wonderful blood spot test um, here in the clinic, very easy to do, and it checks for over 200 different foods and drink, including alcohol. Um, and uh, it very quickly tells us what foods we need to prioritize and eliminate. And the idea is to eliminate roughly for about three months. Mm-hmm. And um, fortunately, in the case of immune um, or food intolerances, the body is forgiving. And within three months, we usually see that people can reintroduce those foods again. So that's the good news at the end of the line. Whereas with an allergy, you have it for life. Yeah, I, you know, I find it interesting, um, and I often see this with clients, is um, people will not really understand, well, how can I be sensitive to something because I don't see the reaction right after I ate it. Mm-hmm. But you know, 24 hours, 72 hours later, you might be seeing manifestations of, of the result of eating that and you know, never really be able to tie it in. How often do we remember what we ate the day before even, right? Yeah. Um, so you can have an item, you know, twice a week and continually have it being affecting and suppressing your immune system. The immune system is looking at it like an invader, right. you know, in a sense, you know, right. yeah. like, like a virus or whatever, but it's a food. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it can be a very tricky thing. Yeah. And oftentimes I find, and you probably as well, is that until we have people food journaling writing down what they're eating and then also writing down when they feel a symptom coming on Mm -hmm. then then we can look two days you know three days back and go oh all right well we see this pattern right yeah you know but the food intolerance is much of a quicker way of you know uh just finding that out and um so what is that actually looking for so we do a blood spot test first Mm -hmm. of all um from what I understand, the nice thing about it is that you don't have to go to a lab, right? You're to right. get a blood draw. It's yeah. just a little finger prick, right? It's just a little finger yeah. prick. And the yeah. company that we use actually has been doing this for about 36 years now, so they have an yeah. excellent track record. And it is very, very simple. A little bit of a blood spot, send it off to the laboratory, and it comes back within you know 10 working days, yeah. and you're off. And we also help our clients then you know, prioritize which of the food intolerances to tackle first. So if somebody has a 20 food intolerances, you know, that's going to be too much to handle. We don't want people eliminating that many foods. Right. So we kind yeah. of pick the big hitters mm-hmm. and we help them devise a diet around that so that it's easy enough because there's always wonderful substitutions out there. Right. And right. we help them find those sub- substitutions so that the, the whole process is a little less painful in yeah, the end. Right. You know? Okay. Yeah. Well why don't we move on to the next question? Yeah. I think we had a, um, a few yeah. more that were We here. did. We got a lot of very good questions here. Yeah. Um, so the, the first question I want to ask you, Marty, is yeah. um, I got, I tend to get sick a lot. What can I do differently? Do you yeah. have some ideas there? Right. And, um, you know, no doubt some of this has been covered in the, in the, um, the seminar series. But um, if I were to kind of nail it down within in 30 years of experience in, in, in clinical practice, um, I would say that it's... <clears throat> Working on on diet would be one of the first things that you want to do because there's so many different foods like we just talked about either identifying triggers that you're sensitive to that's suppressing your immune system or just identify or or starting to slowly take out some of the major things that we know suppress the immune system like sugar. Um, You know, you can get a significant almost 40% suppression in your immune system for up to two hours after drinking a regular soda, you know, yeah. so stuff like that. Um, taking, you know, processed foods out that can suppress your immune system on the, you know, on the immediate front. So th- that would be the first thing. And then also, um, 
something a little harder to maybe do on your own or identify, but we see so often is adrenal health. And uh, maybe it was Paige that talked a little bit about that, but adrenal health um, is huge. If the adrenal glands, which control your stress hormones, cortisol levels, um, they produce adrenaline, you know, your energy, vitality, but if they get suppressed, the whole immune system starts to, to, to get suppressed and the person won't even heal as quickly, believe mm -hmm. it or not. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah. so those are the two big ones that I find uh, are critical in, in working on. Yeah, and Marty, how would you actually work on, on healing the adrenal glands? How would you go about I mean, a lot of people don't even know what the adrenal glands yeah, are, you know? Right, yeah. Um, well, yeah, like we said, they, they, they're small glands above the kidneys. They control a lot of different, you know, they regulate a lot of different uh, hormones. They, have, they play a big role in your energy level. Um, but usually, you know, the, the way that we start is by doing simple testing to see the state of how those adrenal glands are. Mm -hmm. uh, one simple thing you can do at home is take your blood pressure lying down. You might need someone to help you and then take it immediately when you stand up. Your blood pressure should actually rise, you know, four to 10 points mm -hmm. when you stand up because the adrenal glands are kicking adrenaline and it gets your heart to pump blood to your head. Uh, some people might get up quickly and actually get kind of faint or dizzy because yeah. the adrenal glands aren't responding as quick. Yeah. But if that blood pressure actually drops, then we know that, hey, there's a problem right there. Okay. Uh, we do that in the office at times and uh, once we determine what's going on, then we can actually start giving a person the right nutrition to rebuild those adrenals and show them the right diet that would be conducive of that. Yeah, okay, yeah. fantastic, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Next question here is um, <clears throat> really more, this is a kind of a two-part question, but um, is there any, you know, if there's any one thing that I should do as a question, uh, or I should be taking, what would it be? If there's any one thing I should be taking, what would that be? Yeah. Um, so that's a question. Yeah, that's, loaded gun, right, yeah, Marty? We have a lot of good, yeah, a lot of good supplements that we use. Depends but, on the root cause, too. Right, yeah. absolutely. Um, I think my go would my go to would be actually a probiotic. Because okay. um, when we think of the immune system, the immune system, 70% of the immune system is actually in the digestive lining. Okay. And um, the, the curious thing is that the immune system is actually trained in by the gut bacteria. You know, we have over 100 trillion bacteria that live in our digestive system. And they train our immune system in early in life, so okay. the first two years of life, and they continue to keep our immune system strong throughout our life. Okay. And now we're supposed to have about 85% good bacteria in our digestive system mm -hmm. and about 15% not so good. And the good, uh, you know, the bad guys kind of get the good, keep the good guys in check. Right. But yeah. the problem that we see in the clinic over and over again is that imbalance or dysbiosis where most people have too many of the bad guys and they right. have taken over. And this actually can lead to, um, you know, a dysregulated immune system and ultimately disease in the body, specifically autoimmune disease. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the first thing that we want to do is to correct that imbalance. Mm -hmm. And the way we do that is we can use foods, definitely. Yeah. But a fast way of doing that is by actually introducing the correct bacteria into the digestive system. Sure. And yeah. this is where, you know, again, where we advise people yeah. um, because there are a lot of different types of probiotics out there. Right. Um, you know, we have the, the traditional lactoacidophilus and the bifidobacterium, but we also have um, uh, things like Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a beneficial yeast. Yeah. And we also have soil-based bacteria, um, Bacillus bacteria. Mm -hmm. So it's finding the right combination and then also knowing how long to take these probiotics. Because if you take a probiotic indefinitely, and I see this over and over again, you know, our clients, they find a good probiotic that they like yeah. and they continue to take it, but you can actually colonate too much of a good guy right. and they actually become bad guys in yeah. the end. So you need yeah. that diversity and you need that balance. Okay. So Yeah, and that's actually yeah. was one of the other questions that was submitted is well how long do I take, you know, certain supplements? Mm -hmm. So in this instance, um, what I'm hearing you say mm -hmm. is that you know, you don't want to just take one probiotic and just take it indefinitely because you can mm -hmm. actually start to 
you can start with a good thing and create a, a, a imbalance of that, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. So what, what do you normally recommend? Well, normally with the probiotics, I have them finish off one bottle. So they buy yeah. you know a certain type of yeah. probiotic. I have them finish it off. Mm -hmm. I actually have them lay off for about seven days in between. Sure. And then we introduce maybe a different types of species. You know, maybe we'll go from the Lactoacidophilus to more of a soil-based bacteria. Yeah. So we, we yeah. introduce different types of colonies different into strains, yeah. different strains into the gut. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. And why do people get imbalanced to begin with? Why do you think it's such a prominent thing in America? Right that's now? a that's a loaded question, Marty. Yeah. And there's mm -hmm. about a, a at least ten different answers. But I'll I'll tell you a few. One is just the choice of foods that we eat. You know, if we're eating too many sugars, processed foods, bad fats, trans fats, we actually feed the bad guys in yeah. our gut, back in our in our gut, yeah. and they proliferate. Sure. Uh, on the other hand, if we eat um, a well balanced diet, you know, we get good healthy fats and good proteins, and we we watch our our processed carbs, especially we collimate the good guys in our digestive system. But there are definitely other factors as well. You know, medications can alter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the bacteria that live in our digestive system, stress is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find this fascinating, and one of the studies I was reading is that an inert, kind of a neutral bacteria, if you're under a lot of stress, it actually can turn into a virulent bacteria. Wow. Yeah. So stress and our emotional state have a big impact on the health of our gut sure. bacteria. Yeah. Um, and then there are, of course, a lot of other things, a lot like of other factors, and antibiotics, yeah, yeah right. the medications okay. they yeah. mentioned, um, okay. the food intolerances, they yeah. come back into play again. Um, so we have to look at the, the full symptom picture. You cannot just isolate one or two elements. Sure. You have to look at the person as a whole. Yeah, yeah. that's good. That's, mm -hmm. that's holistic medicine. That's what yeah. we do. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, why don't we move on to the next one? All right. So, Marty, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, what's the difference between whole food supplements and synthetic supplements? You know, with the ones that we pick up in the Walgreens and CVS and Costco yeah, versus yeah. some of the ones that we use here in our clinic. Okay. Can you describe the difference between those? Sure, yeah. I mean, first off, we really pride ourselves in using more whole food um, therapeutic nutrition. Um, and. What that is, is it's really, you know, it's concentrated, um, it's taking foods that are grown organically and then, um, you know, more or less breaking it, not breaking it down with, with anything uh, harmful. So all the enzymes would stay intact, but basically bringing it into uh, a form, like a powdered form, and then that's pressed into a tablet without altering any of the properties of that that original food mm -hmm. so you have a concentrated uh, therapeutic food stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> you know that yeah. you're taking in a tablet form right yeah. um, so the body can look at that the way God designed us the body can look at that and recognize it as real food and it's going to utilize it fully um, synthetic vitamins are taking like for instance a synthetic B vitamin is isolated fractionated B1, B2, B3, B6, but it's actually derived from coal tar. So it, oh, it's, wow. and so the molecular structure of that B1 is the same molecular structure of the B1 in food, but it doesn't have all the enzymes and cofactors that are naturally there that got put there. Mm -hmm. So therefore the body looks at that synthetic B vitamin and goes, your body's like, I don't, I don't recognize it as real food. So it's gonna rob those enzymes and cofactors from you to figure out how to metabolize it. So it's actually, mm -hmm. it's actually creating other deficiencies as you're trying to you know, mm -hmm. uh, utilize it. Yeah. Um, whereas the whole food nutrients are going to just restore the body much quicker and more thoroughly uh, in that respect. Right, and yeah. the truth is we're still finding so many cofactors you know it's like uh, right. like with vitamin c we know it's not just ascorbic acid exactly. it has yeah. so many different other components right. and we still don't even know you know yeah. what else nature is yeah uh, what we still have to discover yeah you know? i mean a good example you you touched on it is vitamin c we actually see a lot of people with a low level subclinical scurvy which mm -hmm. is a vitamin c mm -hmm. deficiency what does that look like well they bruise too easily or you know 
whatever it could be thing you know the vessels are hemorrhaging or you know yeah. things like that um ascorbic acid doesn't solve scurvy yeah. uh, it's yeah. just the wrapper of the molecule of vitamin c you need the whole the whole element of that substance to actually solve that and yeah. usually that's how we do solve it i yeah. see that all the time i had two cases this week actually that way yeah. And, and just eating, you know, I'm thinking of vitamin C rich foods would be things like oranges and mm -hmm. kiwis. We know that a lot of our foods now are, you know, they, they don't have the 50% lower right. nutrient yeah. content today yeah. than they did 50 over, or yeah. 100 years ago. Over farming and yeah. Yeah, things like that. So supplements actually become a necessity, yeah. you know, not just right. you know, something that we casually take but it's exactly. for a lot of people it becomes essential yeah, yeah yeah and there's a lot of foods that we just there's a lot of food stuff that we don't get through the balance of our diet you know? yeah i think there was a second part to yeah that i'm going to ask you that yeah. and um someone was asking whether these supplements are also safe to take for children yeah and that's a that's an easy question that's a beautiful tie-in and and uh, what i often tell people is that well you know you you might take less for a child because mm -hmm. based on body weight but mm -hmm. if a child can eat food and that's safe for them mm -hmm. then these whole food supplements are safe okay. and uh, that's the beauty in, in whole yeah. food nutrition so we can't overdose right. with the, yeah. the young one yeah. okay yeah. Yeah. good Marty yeah mm -hmm. um, and then just uh, I have one final one on the supplements and that is somebody was asking you know how long should I supplement for yeah. You know, is this right. something I do indefinitely or um, yeah. a short period of time until my symptoms are gone? Yeah, I mean that 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 can be that can vary depending on what you're trying to accomplish. You know, like if I'm trying to accomplish vitamin C deficiency mm -hmm. or scurvy, you know, subclinical scurvy. <coughs> excuse me. Um, then, yeah, then I might. Uh, you know, go on heavier doses of that whole food vitamin C for a period of time until I notice the bruising is stopping. I'm not mm -hmm. bruising so easily, <clears throat> and then scale it back down, and they may be able to phase out of it at that point and try to get more in just mm -hmm. from their diet. Mm -hmm. um, in other cases, it really depends. Uh, that's where oftentimes we can regulate that through, um, you know, when we're testing people to mm -hmm. determine, okay, if, is the adrenal glands or, or different organs that we're working on, are they improving? Yeah. <clears throat> and we will know if we should scale off of some of those supplements. But, you know, there are certain foundational things like a good whole food multivitamin or probiotics that mm -hmm. you might want to be doing long term because of the environment, the harsh environment we live in. You know, a lot of chemicals in our environment and right. um, over farmed fields, so we need to be able to get those elements that you're not getting normally. Yeah, and that again ties into our whole topic of uh, strengthening the right. immune system. Exactly. You know, making sure that the immune system has all of the nutrients yeah. that it needs to function optimally. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. I think we covered all of our questions, Marty. Do you have some? Yeah, I mean, the last, really, the last question that that I you know saw on the list was that you know, people are asking, or a few people have, have submitted that you know, I'm ready, I've, I've, I really like what I've heard so far with this whole series and I'm ready to get started. Um, you know, what do I do? You know, what, what happens next? And uh, in some of the end of our series, we talked about that you can call for a phone, uh, basically consult, if you will, and uh, that's a no obligation thing. And, you know, Maybe you can kind of yeah. tell the audience, why do we do that to begin with, you know, yeah, just real briefly. Yeah. Yeah. So this is actually a 15-minute free consultation. Yeah. Um, so you can tell us all about the things that you have going on. And it's a way of both filtering out um, where we can help and where we can't help. Because right. obviously there are certain things that you know are beyond our scope, uh, mm -hmm. and hopefully we can refer you on. But it's also an opportunity for you to get to know us and the type of work that we do. You know, we can explain some of the testing that we do here in the clinic. So it's it's a nice introduction. Um, right. And then from there, uh, we actually uh, will, you know, schedule an appointment. And your initial appointment would be about an hour and a half in length, where we go through the, the testing, some of which Marty already explained, so that we get a good baseline on some of the issues that are particularly your concerns 
and also the ones that we discover yeah. underlying right. issues because right. here in naturopathic medicine we always look you know what's at the root of every illness you know we want to get at the root cause we don't want to just mask the symptoms um, so that's why we take that time with our clients um, mm -hmm. and you know we do the investigative work yeah. and um, uh, the programs that we offer here you know, we like to work with clients for at least six months, um, anywhere between three and six months to start, and then beyond, of right. course, because with natural healing, it's it takes some time, right. um, yeah. you know, but again, um, hopefully we set you on a path where not only are you um, healing the root cause of the illness, but then also really exponentially um, optimizing your health and the strength of your immune system. Right. So, Marty, yeah. um, you know, the, all they need to do is make a phone call, right? And, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I often get people, like, just relieved. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's like, here we go. But um, they're, they're kind of relieved when, when they, they get on that call and they realize that, hey, this is not, you know, they're not pushing me in any direction. Mm -hmm. Frankly, there's times when, you know, we'll tell someone that, you know, this isn't, this isn't the area of our expertise on what you're dealing with. You know, it's beyond what, but, but we may recommend, you know, a, another practitioner, you know, mm -hmm. in some other county or whatever, but, um, but really it's to build rapport and to understand, Hey, is this the right fit? Can we be helpful? And this is, is this a right matchup? Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, within that, within that, uh, the, if we do go forward, uh, the initial visits about an hour and a half and we do um, what's called a heart rate variability test which helps us to understand much more about your your health than your heart but it helps us understand the relationship of how your nervous system and your organs are functioning mm -hmm. we do uh, I talked about um, the uh, medioxy test which is a test that tells us if the inflammation on the cell wall is going on 50 times more accurate than blood work so um, that's actually part of that initial, mm -hmm. as long as, as as well as some other hands-on testing that mm -hmm. the had, adrenal testing, yeah, that you the mentioned, adrenal testing, body all composition, of that, body composition, yeah. um, going over any existing blood work that you might have, even if it's six months old, yeah. right? Um, all the practitioner time for that full hour and a half. That's all included in that visit. Uh, normally two hundred and forty-seven dollars, but you know it's all you have to do is is when you call in, uh, you just tell hey you know that you listen to this the immune seminar series mm -hmm. and uh, you know we're, we're going to offer a, a much different price it's 197 oh, so uh, you know it, it's something a no-brainer <laughs> yeah we talked about um, mm -hmm. it's you know the, the value and the tests are worth more than that mm -hmm. um, plus all the other you know, yeah. you know yeah. benefit so that's something that you know as um, uh, you know, with management, we, we kind of decided to offer that, you know, yeah. in that respect. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So going back again, the first step is to make that phone call. And the number here is 262-251-2929. And we really look forward to helping you on your, your journey to better health. Yeah. The website, totalhealthinc.com, just as a reminder as well.